This video covers non-parametric statistics, so that's what you use if you have uh, non-normal distributions. I don't think they're strictly necessary, but before we break the rules, uh, let, let's learn how to do it according to the rules. Um, there are two types of non-parametric tests. So the first ones, the modern ones, they are enabled by uh, computer simulations. Uh, so Monte Carlo procedures, uh, permutations, different kinds of shuffling and subsetting your data. Um, so I explain to you how that works uh, in this video. And then there are also uh, the classical rank sum tests. Uh, these ones have the disadvantage that they don't have quite the same uh, statistical power. Uh, so the modern tests, they are equals to the uh, parametric statistics. Uh, but the classic tests, they are compromised. They are based on ranking your observations and uh, you lose the magnitude information. So that's why they lose power in detecting statistical differences. Um, but they are actually still fun. Uh, it's nice to understand them and, you know, people are still using them. So it's just good to know how they work. But let's start with the modern tests here. So I walk you through an example of how these work. So non-parametric tests are designed for situations like this. We can imagine our uh, Lendl experiment, a uh, simple one-way ANOVA uh, with different treatment levels. So we have our varieties A, B, and C, and those different varieties have different yields. And if your data are not normally distributed, uh, but have funny distributions like this, then technically parametric statistics are not recommended. Um, so non-parametric statistics are designed to not have that assumption of normality and homogeneity of variances. And it's really quite clever how this works. Um, so I'll show it to you here. So we'll start with our regular data table. We have a predictor variable here, treatment with uh, replications. We get our individual yield values. And I just uh, put a few numbers here to illustrate the example. So in a normal analysis of variance, you would calculate the sums of squares within uh, treatment levels and between treatment levels. Uh, and we've done this in one of the earlier labs. Um, and we could do it also here uh, to get our F value. But instead of uh, using sums of squares, what you usually use in permutational ANOVA, because it doesn't matter, is absolute distances. So we don't, we don't work with variances. We don't have to worry about bias corrections or things like that. So we can just use plain distances or differences. So distances, I wrote this here because this can be extended to multivariate uh, problems. So if you have multiple response variables besides yield, uh, this is a very handy multivariate technique that works with distances. But here uh, you can also read differences. So I simply ask, what are my differences within uh, treatments and what are my differences between treatment? So within, I can calculate this here, 710 minus 690 would be 20, 710 minus 730 would also be 20, and 690 minus 730 would be 40. So if I take the absolute values. And I can do this with uh, all of the others as well. And then I also calculate the differences or distances between. So those are bigger in this case. Uh, so 710 minus 480 is uh, 230. And 710 minus 510 is 200. And I can do all the combinations, obviously. Um, and in the end, I uh, just take the average of my differences within and differences between. So I didn't do that because it's lots of combinations, so that's for the computer to do. But let's just assume that my distances within are relatively small, so let's say 25, looks like about 25, and the distances between are uh, quite big, so let's say 250. Um, now I can calculate a signal-to-noise ratio that would actually be almost equivalent to an F value. Just because we use the distances here, I call this a D statistic. But it's the same idea, so it's 250 to 25, that's my signal-to-noise ratio of 10. And now, I just need to know the distribution of my D statistic, right? So if I have a signal-to-noise ratio of 10, that looks promising, so 10 times more signal than noise. And if this was an F distribution, it, it would have the shape of an F distribution. But uh, because our data is a little uh, screwed up here, we don't actually know how that distribution of those ratios would look like. So 
that's a problem. We don't know what that is. Um, and that's where the computer can help us to generate this empirically with permutations. And uh, in order to understand what the computer does here, let's think about again what the F distribution really means. So if we were to randomly sample from a population for two samples, um, but we sample the same population, so there's no effect, and we were to calculate signal-to-noise ratios, our expectation is that this is a one-to-one -one ratio. If we take two samples A and B from the same population, then we would probably get an F value of around one. So signal to noise is one to one and uh, it may not be exactly one so it may sit a little bit to the right here and now if we were to do this again uh, we might we might get another one that's a little lower and uh, again another one that's here and if I do this an infinite amount of times eventually I would get a F distribution that peaks at one and then has this nice uh, tail here toward the end so what we have to figure out is how to repeatedly sample our data, but with no effect, to build this distribution for uh, the kind of data that we have here that's not normally distributed. And the way we can do it is uh, very simple. So we're just going to randomly assign our treatments. So I have three A values. I'm just going to put one here and another one there and another one there. Then we have three B treatments. There's one. There's one, there's one, and C, C, C. So I just have randomly shuffled up my uh, treatment values. And now I can ignore this left column here entirely. So I'll do my analysis as if these were my true treatments. But they are shuffled. So on average, I would expect no effects. So that is how I uh, get one of those values. So now if I calculate my differences within and my differences between, because they're all shuffled up, uh, my expectation would be that they're about the same. So maybe 50 and 50 um, as my signal to noise ratio. So it should be something near one. That's my expectation. But of course, sometimes, you know, my random shuffling may yield bigger signal to noise ratio. So that's very possible. So that was my first point, And now I'm going to do this again. So I am going to erase. Uh, all these values here. Uh, so that, well, that was my first permutation. I'm done with that. And now I do a completely different one. So C, 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 B, 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 and A, A, A. And I recalculate this again. And um, so I get another of these points. And um, so, so slowly, I'm going to build a histogram here uh, of my true F distribution if there were no effects, right? And then once I'm done with this, I can compare where my 10 sits. So if I do this for 10,000 permutations, so this on the computer that takes less than a second, um, I can calculate how many of my randomly generated D values, so my kind of F statistics, uh, were smaller than this 10 here, <clears throat> so this is probably the majority, uh, but there may be some that just by random chance are larger than 10. And then I have my p-value, right? So I can say what's the probability of getting a d statistic as large or larger than the observed one just by random chance. Um, so in this case it would be 79 over my 5000 permutation. So 79 I got a value as big or bigger just by random chance. So that's pretty cool. And uh, you, will, you will see this works perfectly, right? So it gives you exactly the same answer as a normal analysis of variance. So you can literally just count out your p-value. So there's no distributions that need to be fitted. There's no assumptions here about anything. Uh, that, that's really a very elegant solution. So if you set your uh, number of permutations, uh, you usually set this to 5,000 or to 10,000 uh, because your smallest p-value is limited by the number of permutations. So if you only do 20 permutations, the max you can get is 1 over 20. So your smallest p-value that you can possibly calculate is 0 0.05. But if you don't have enough permutations, uh, you can never tell what the true p-value is. So set it fairly high. I would say 10,000 permutations is a good value. Uh, that's often the default. And uh, this can give you a p-value as 
smaller 0 0.001 and if it's less than that you don't usually care so it's a it's a already a very highly significant result and while while that is a super cool technique uh, it's also unfortunately not really necessary to use it uh, because parametric statistics are so extremely robust uh, against the assumption of normality and i just want to demonstrate this to you why you really don't need any non-parametric statistics so let's uh, start with some data generation here so i'm just going to create a gamma distribution so everybody would agree that uh, this is really not normally distributed and you shouldn't do your ANOVA um, and let's do another one so this one differs in that I add plus four here so I want to test for differences between population one and two so you see that's a little shifted over and if I were to run a t-test or ANOVA with a sample of, on those two populations I should be wrong right so that, that should not work because I, I brutally violate the assumption of normality. Uh, so let's sample those. Uh, so I sample population one and population two and do a box plot. And you can see also in my sample, uh, this is not normally distributed. So I have an asymmetry here. Um, and I have this long tail. So I, I got this outlier here from my gamma distribution. Uh, that's quite often. And you know that that is really a red flag. You should definitely transform your data if you have something like that. Um, but as you will see, uh, it all does not matter. So what I do next is I'm just going to uh, convert all this into a standard data table. So I just have these S1 and S2 samples. But if I want to run an ANOVA, I need a standard data table. Um, this code is in the lab. You can check what it does. I'm just going to run it, run it here as a set. Um, so I just call this one my control and this one my um, fertilizer treatment. So one is higher than the other. And here are my values, so maybe height of uh, subplant. And you can see I have these funny outliers here and uh, uh, this, this should give me a headache um, for a normal analysis of variance. So let's try it anyways. So let's run our normal analysis of variance. Uh, with an ANOVA table and I get 0.02 uh, that's very nice um, F value so this executes just fine but you know the concern would be you know, that your inference is not valid because you violate the assumption of normality in a big way especially with that outlier here um, so let's use the permutational analysis of variance that, that I just explained how it works so this is a the command here is AOVP or actually you can also call this LMP for linear model permutational and it doesn't matter it's the same function and uh, so we do exactly the same here and see what it what it gives us so 0.0215 so it is a little bit different but it's it's not exactly a game changer and the downsides really outweigh the benefits. So there's quite a few downsides to using non-parametric statistics. First of all, you have no access to effect size statistics. You also don't have access to convenient uh, contrasts and pairwise comparisons. So some of the um, functions actually work with the output of permutational ANOVA, uh, but they use the standard error. So then you're back to violating the assumption of normality. You also have no access to the least squares means procedure, which can give you really much better estimates of your means if you have uh, unbalanced designs or missing values. And you also have no access to mixed models. And uh, so one of the really great benefits of mixed models is that they have very sophisticated algorithms to estimate your means and all the parameters that you care about. So for simple designs, there's no really severe downside to using non-parametric statistics. But for any complex design, I would forget them. You know, you're much better off with the parametric uh, statistics. And the reason why this works, I mean, I said it before and I say it again, it's just that the central limit theorem kicks in, right? So the assumption is not that your data needs to be normally distributed. It's the distribution of the means under a repeated sampling scenario, right? Under a theoretical repeated sampling scenario, the question is, would the distribution of the means of your samples be normally distributed? So that's described by the standard error. That's described by the contrast intervals that you use for effect size statistics. So those are all sound. Uh, these are all going to be normally distributed, even if your original data is not. And uh, so you really don't have to worry about it. And the best proof is that you actually get 
absolutely accurate p-values and uh, confidence intervals and standard errors are all the same whether you do it with parametric or on this completely different non-parametric procedure right which is super cool so a completely different way of going about it and you get almost exactly the same values every time so it is nice i like to cover it just for fun but it's not really useful